<laughs> this is awesome. I welcome everyone to the Cumberland County Historical Society. And I take it everyone is interested in mills here. <laughs> well, this is just fantastic. I just want to make a quick announcement. If you have a cell phone or any electronic device, please turn it off at this time. We don't want to interrupt our speakers with phones going off. Okay. Mills, mills, mills. You will hear that word quite often this year. This is the year of the mill. And we are very excited about one of our new tours, two mills. We have four tours planned in May. Two tours will be going to along the Conner de Gwinnett, and we have two offered along the Yellow Breaches. For the month of May, we have a special price, one price for everyone, member or non-member, of $85. And this includes your lunch. If you are interested in the mills and one of these trips, uh, we have a limit of 13 people per bus load. We have our own small minibus now. It's a 15 passenger, which includes the bus driver and the guide. So we have 13 spots available. So if you are interested, Lucy will be more than happy, or whoever's at the front desk will be more than happy to sign you up today. Also, we have our new mill exhibit that will be opening on Friday, March 27th. If you want to experience a working water wheel, our fantastic museum crew has created one in the, in the, in the uh, Kramer Gallery. If you don't already know this, we have a very talented museum staff, and they create these wonderful exhibits for our community, not just for our members, but for our community. I encourage you to please come out and support them. Come and see this exhibit through, it goes from March into uh, October. And bring your friends. Our museum is free, so there's no excuse not to invite your friends to come and experience this. And if you're not a member, I have flyers back there. I encourage you to become one. We have a lot of very exciting things going on uh, in our new brochure. I also have those printed out. They will be going out in the mail. I am hoping next week. Uh, so you can see what is coming up in uh, for our spring and summer uh, brochure uh, events and, bus, and little mini bus trips and one bus trip and all kinds of just exciting stuff. Uh, today's presentation is the mills on the yellow breaches. It is definitely my pleasure to introduce Richard Tritt, our uh, photo curator, which is in the back of the room standing by the door. He will be one of the pre presenters. David uh, Smith, who is our Camp the Show guide and also a great volunteer here. And Mary Lou Shawman, who was a past president of the Historical Society. Let's give them all a great big welcome. Good afternoon. On behalf of the, uh, the committee, the Mill Committee, I'd like to add my welcome to all of you for, for being here today. This is something that we have been doing for five years. Five years ago, a group of us, about nine of us, got together and mapped out a plan for researching this book. We knew it was not going to be something that was going to be quick. It was going to take a lot of really hard first-person uh, primary source material to, to delve into creating. This is part of the result of it. All those dots there represent a location where we're certain there was a mill. The people, Richard Tritt led our group. Uh, we had two people who worked with us early in the project, Charlie Bender and Bob Rowland. And then uh, the main body of the group was Rachel Zuck. Uh, Rachel's here in the back. Uh, Rob is around somewhere uh, from the staff. Sue Meehan, who is over here, you'll be hearing from her next week when we do the Conan and Gwinnett Mills. Dan Drawball is right there. Uh, Dan was our uh, expert on uh, 
the, the workings of the mill, the engineering part of how mills work. Uh, Sandy Mader and myself, and then later in the project, particularly after Bob Rowland left the project, Mary Lou Shaw joined us. So that was the group that, that put this all together. We divided the task logically into geographic, geographical and topical areas, and then began our work. Today is an introduction to that work, which culminates in the publication of a 350-page book sometime next month. Hopefully, um, the goal is to have it here and available when the museum op uh, exhibit opens later in March. And then there'll be the bus tours that Linda has already mentioned to you. Today's talk, as she said, will focus on the Yellow Breaches Creek, and then a similar one next Wednesday on the Conondogwinna Creek. Richard, I think we're ready for the, for the lights to come down. Sure, that, that's actually Mary Lou's sound effects, and I don't know why we're getting it uh, at the beginning, but uh, you'll see why later that we have the sound effects at least on one of our, one of our slides. Uh, Yellow Breaches Creek rises on the slopes of South Mountain in Southampton and South Newton Townships. That area also provides the headwaters for Middle Spring Creek, which eventually flows into the Conna de Gwinnett, Mountain Creek, which eventually enters the Yellow Breaches, at Mount Holly Springs, and then the headwaters of a variety of streams, including Big Pond Run, Stroms Run, and Watery Hollow Run, uh, which are the feeder streams for the Yellow Breaches Creek, which begins at Three Springs. It, from Three Springs, it flows for 46 and a half miles uh, to the Susquehanna River, with added inflow of water at places like Irish Gap Run and the springs at Huntsdale, Little Dogwood Run in Monroe Township, and Cedar Run in Lower Island Township. When settlers first arrived in Cumberland County in the mid 18th century, they were faced with creating a home in a true wilderness. They had to clear land, erect homes, and other structures to begin life in a new land, often faced with hostile indigenous populations. Many of those settlers brought with them, however, the knowledge and ability to use water power to lighten the load of their work and to provide for an improved standard of living. Most of us, when we're thinking about mills, tend to think about grist mills as, as what the mills were. But they actually provided uh, work relief in a variety of, of areas. So we're going to take a look at some of those now. The grist mill, as I've already mentioned, was a place where farmers would bring their produce, corn and other grains, to make flour or meal. The earliest of these, according to some records, was established at Shippensburg, the Leaper Mill in the 1830s, 1730s. A merchant mill does the same kind of work, but not directly for the farmer. The miller acquires the, the various grains and produces flour or meal for sale on the open market. The mill shown here is Enks Mill in Dickinson Township. A chop mill does similar work to what a, a, a grist mill does, only it's making animal food. Saw mills are not emphasized in this book. There were many, many, many of them. That map would have been covered with probably twice as many dots on it if we had focused on the saw mills. They often existed for a very brief period of time, so we did not include them in this book. Uh, the reason they didn't last very long is sometimes they were built only to make the lumber needed for construction projects right there at the site, and then they were either uh, went out of business or they uh, were converted for use for some other product. There were some sawmills, however, that were fairly elaborate and made such things as doors, windows, and shutters. Another type of mill was the fulling mill. Fulling mills prepared wool for manufacture of woolen goods. A woolen factory and carding machine often accompanied the work at a fooling mill. The mill shown here is the Horner's Mill in South Middleton Township. A hemp mill of similar type processed flax fibers to make a rough cloth for clothing and sacking and was also used in the making of rope. Oil mills processed flaxseed oil 
or linseed oil from flaxseed. This is the Grissinger oil mill in North Middleton Township. Another early type of mill made uh, popular, particularly during the American Revolution, made gunpowder. These were very dangerous operations, and at least the two that I did research on both resulted in explosions killing the mill. A plaster mill made lime from limestone, which was used to make fertilizer, and also in the production of mortar and plaster for construction purposes. The paper mills produced a variety of kinds of paper, including writing paper, newsprint, and cardboard. This mill, uh, actually some of those buildings are still located in Mount Holly Springs. Clover seed mills hold clover seed to prepare it to be used for planting, and bark and sumac mills were part of the leather industry. An iron ore blast furnace is not one we usually think of as related to mills, but it did use water power to drive the bellows that made the fire hot enough to melt the ore. So they are included in this, in the book. The Yellow Breaches watershed uh, relied heavily on tax records, as did all of the, as did the Con and the as well, in determining what mills existed from 1750 to 1900. In addition to the tax records, we use deeds, old maps, newspaper reports, and a variety of other records to help inform our, our effort. Those of us who did the Yellow Breaches research also had an additional source, a talk given here to the Society in 1909 by John Miller. It gave us a 100 or more than 100 year old snapshot of the mills as they existed at that time or of the knowledge people had of mills that had existed before that time. The Yellow Breaches rises in this area, you know, on the slopes of South Mountain. This is actually South Newton, or the southern section of Newton Township. This is from the 1858 map. <clears throat> so the Newton Township was, was one large township at that time. This would be the Southampton side, and you can see the streams that are flowing out of the mountain. This would be present day Penn Township. As it goes into the, uh, to Clark's Run, then to Pine Run, around the village of Jacksonville or Wall Bottom to here to Three Springs. And this is where we're considering uh, the creek to uh, officially begin. However, there were mills on these tiny little streams. Any of you that have been ever, ever been up in the Big Pond area know how small these streams are but there were mills located along that. One of them was Clark's Mill. So for a time, this stream feeding out of South Newton, or South Middleton, I'm sorry, Southampton, I'll get it right here, uh, was called Clark's Run. Later on, someone named Levi Strom owned it, and the name changed to Strom's Run. That mill was in operation from 1789 to 1814. Another mill in the area was the David Foreman Mill in the, around the 1830s. The major water power business, as has already been mentioned, was the Big Pond Iron Furnace. There were other furnaces in Southampton Township, but uh, this is one that was in Yellow Breaches watershed. John Moore and Edward Biddle built it in 1836. It went through a variety of owners during the course of its lifetime eventually being acquired by the Philadelphia and Reading Coal and Iron Company in 1870. Closed for a period of time, then they reopened it. Um, the Alls were responsible, they didn't own it, but they were responsible for the rebuilding of it. And within that, the year that it had been rebuilt in 1883, it totally burned and was never rebuilt. And this picture was taken about 1934. It's actually part of a series of pictures the CCC camp that was located right next door to this mill. Upstream from uh, the uh, actual iron furnace works were these diversion uh, structures which took water from Big Pond Run and moved it into this hand dug race. Uh, one of the things I think that most amazed us as we worked on these mills were these races, all completely hand dug or possibly the help of horses to some degree, uh, and have the length of them. This one goes for about 300 yards. Uh, and there were others that are, are similar length. Uh, obviously, some are actually much shorter as well. 
Several other mills existed along uh, the streams in this area, the Seavers Mill and the Buchanan Mill uh, in particular. One of the interesting things about the Buchanan Mill, which was located on the west end of the village of Walnut Bottom, was that toward the end of its life, it was owned by two uh, maiden uh, sisters, and they, in the tax records, they are referred to as the, as the Mrs. Buchanan. We finally come to the main body of Yellow Breaches Creek at Three Springs, and you can see it flows through the township as, it, as it's shown here. This is the western section of a road paper that shows the first major mill in that area, and it was the Moore Mill. John Moore had, had built it in, the, uh, in 1767. He passed it along to Matthew Kyle, so it was known as Kyle's Mill, in 1838, and then by 1857, it was Elias B. Eister's Mill, and the name, that, of course, was changed uh, as appropriate. Two mill races, interestingly enough, feed the site of the original mill. The miller's house still stands. And this millstone is one that has been preserved by the Dodds family, who currently live in the uh, former miller's house. Two other mills in the area were the Hendricks Mill and the Patterson Grist Mill. Uh, many of you familiar with the Penn Township area will know of what was the uh, Long, Long Store Station, there was a railroad station there, and then also the, the uh, Cumberland Valley uh, Cooperative was located there. When that mill was there, however, it did not use the water power. The next major uh, influx of uh, mills was at Milltown, and obviously there had to be more than one mill to, for it to be called Milltown. Uh, the research here was, was a little difficult to do, because none of the mill structures survive. Uh, this is the other end of that map that we looked at earlier with Moore's Mill on it. This shows the water coming down out of the mountain. And it, that's actually what's dammed. It's not Yellow Breaches Creek, but it's actually the stream coming out of the mountain and then all of the springs in the Huntsdale area that fed all the various mill activities that went on in that, in that area. The first one that John Miller mentioned was Lynn's Distillery, and it was actually up on Irish Gap Run, and he was believed to have run it from 1828 to 1841. We believe it eventually became part of the major milling complex known as Eggie's Mills. That's what Huntsdale looked like before the fish hatchery when one of the surviving mills still stood. This was the Eggie Mill or the Weekly Mill that was still standing at that time. All this area, uh, where all the springs were, uh, was a, an area where watercress was grown. The Eggie Mill, we believe, was built, uh, of course, according to the tax records in 1793, went through a variety of owners and a variety of mill operations. So we do think there were more than one mill buildings here, because there was both the grist and the merchant mill, there was a sawmill, there was a distillery, which may have been that Lynn's distillery, there was an oil mill, and a full fulling and wooling factory, fulling mill and wooling factory located here at Huntsdale. However, there was also a second grist mill. This is the weekly mill, or the eggy mill. And this is, we're not sure which mill was this, uh, Grain sack comes from. H.K. Miller was a miller, not the owner. Uh, but we know of the time frame had to be late 19th century because HPRR stands for the Harrisburg Potomac Railroad, uh, which went through the area in the 1870s. It is still the surviving railroad in Cumberland County today. The earliest mill was this one, also a grist mill. It's known as the Smith's Mill, but it was actually built by Arthur Clark in 1750. It was subsequently owned uh, by James Smith and then later his widow, Margaret. What's interesting is we did this research to find that a number of women were the owners of the mills when their husbands died, and they then took over the operation, or at least the responsibility. <coughs> One of the later owners 
of that mill and some of the other industrial enterprises at Huntsdale was General Thomas C. Miller. Uh, and he operated this mill and built this house as his home. It eventually became the home for the superintendent of the fish hatchery. Another business that we have almost no records of at all, and I, you're, I know you're looking at the jail, <laughs> was the Cumberland Iron Furnace. Again, because of the hatchery, there's nothing left. It's, it's totally gone, no remnants of it at all. But it was built as the Cumberland Iron Furnace in 1794. It goes way back. When he died, it passed to him, Mary Eggie Chambers, his daughter, and, and Eliza Eggie. They sold to Frederick Watts and eventually to T.C. Miller, who we just mentioned, and his partner, Thomas Cooper. It then went to Peter Tritt, who dismantled it in the 1850s, and yes, he is an uh, ancestor of Richard's, is responsible for the removal of this. The reason you're looking at the jail is that there is a story, we've not been able to prove it, but it's reported in a number of different places. So this may be bad history, but uh, because it's something that may relate to the Cumberland Furnace, I show the picture here. The story is that the original courthouse had this fence around it, made by the forge at Cumberland Furnace. When the jail was built, the, furnace, the fence was moved here to be in front of the jail. So the next time you walk by there, you may be looking at something that came from Cumberland Iron Furnace. Other businesses in the area were Black's Clover and Plaster Mill and Johnston's Fooling Mill. This now takes us to Dickinson Township. This is actually uh, the 1858 map, and you can see the streams flowing through the township here. All of the mills in Dickinson Township were on the creek. Anks Mill is the first one we come to on Anks Mill Road. George Ank was the miller there in the late 19th century, he never owned it, but somehow or other his name has become attached to this mill. It probably should either be called Eggie's Mill, because there's another one that the Eggie's built, or it should be called Cumberland Mills. It actually carried that same, Cumberland Hall, Cumberland Mills, Cumberland Furnace was a frequent name used in that area. This is a road paper, sorry, there should be a road paper here somewhere, there it is. This is a road paper that shows the location of, and it's identified here as Mikey, Michael Eggie's Mill. The mill is significant historically as, and architecturally. It's extremely unusual. It is actually two mills. As you can see, here's the one on the right. This is from the back. Here's the one on the left. The mill race ran through the buildings, and there were structures in here that allowed the water to be diverted to either side to run the, the various milling operations in whichever side of the mill the miller was using at that time. Uh, very unusual architecturally, these stone coins uh, are, are unusual. The way it's made on the inside with the very heavy walnut beams is unusual. Unfortunately, as you can see, it's not in good condition. Uh, so if someone's out there with very deep pockets that like to restore an old mill, here's one that we could, we'd like to preserve. It's the first surviving mill structure in western Cumberland County. We do have the iron furnace at the Big Pond, uh, but in terms of an actual mill, that's the first one. The next one we come to is Moordale Mill. It's just off Walnut Bottom Road, where Montsevral Road crosses uh, Yellow Breaches Creek. Uh, operated here for many years. For those of you familiar with the Moordale section of Carlisle, there is a definite connection here. The, final, the last owner of this mill uh, was Johnston Moore. He built an estate on the western side of Carlisle, which when it was sold became the Moordale housing area. This mill dates back to 1793 and, and pretty much stayed in the Moore family during that entire time. It was built by William Moore, who also built Cumberland Hall. The next mill is called Hawks Forge, though it dates back much earlier than his uh, time that he had it. Or at this point, it was a sawmill, but uh, there was actually a forge located here earlier on. It was originally built
1770 uh, by James Moore, and it passed through a variety of owners until it was acquired by Adam Houck in 1793. From Adam Houck, it passed to the Martin family, and descendants of the Martin family own the property today. This is where the, the forge was actually located. And as they have done work in this area, they're farmers, they keep coming upon things like this. They find these metal things that were part of the forge operation. The next mill in the area is not a very well documented in terms of paperwork that we could find for it. Uh, Miller, John Miller does not mention it in his talk, uh, but it was located on what we know today as the Woods Farm. And one of the interesting things about the Woods is, is that they were very active in the Underground Railroad. So this area would have been prime activity area for the uh, <coughs> Underground Railroad operation. The next mill is this one, the Sterritts Mill. Again, it was not mentioned by Miller either. Uh, the main reason we know about it, in addition to a few mentions in the tax records, is an extensive article written about it on November 30th, 1871, when it burned. As you'll learn from Mary Lou, the spire theme tends to uh, be an important one as it relates to mills. And the final mill in Dickinson Township is uh, one that many of you will be familiar with, the Weekly Mill or the Barnett's Mill. It was built by the Weeklies in 1770. It was a milling complex. The mill that stands there today <clears throat> was not the original mill. If you go to Stewart Park to, to view this area, the original milling operations, a fulling mill, a cooperage, uh, the, the grist mill, a uh, saw mill, were all located on the other side of the creek. And eventually, they moved, for some reason, the main grist mill to this side of the creek. And that's what's <coughs> today. This is what it looks like after stabilization uh, when Dickinson Township acquired it. And a grant from the Stewart Foundation was used to at least get the building back to stable condition. This one also needs extensive renovation. The goal of the township is to be able to use it uh, as a place for meetings uh, and other activities. But it is uh, currently totally off limits to uh, visitors. Uh, you can certainly view it, but you can't go in it. Uh, I'm now going to turn the microphone over to Richard, and he's going to lead us into South Mount, South Middleton and uh, Monroe Townships. Well, I researched uh, the mills that were located in South Middleton and Monroe Township, mainly because I lived in that area. And today I'll just give you a, a quick overview of 12 of the mills, or more, more than that. This is a detail of the township from the 1858 map. Major stream, where the yellow breaches rose through the middle, one of the main, tri main tributaries that flows in, in South Middleton is Mountain Creek, which adds quite a, a lot of water to the main stream. There are two smaller streams here, and then the lake at Boiling Springs, the, the springs of Boiling Springs, they add 22 million gallons a day to the water flow. So that may be one of the reasons there are so many mills and large mills in South Middleton Township. So look at, going across here, we can see the, uh, on Route 34, what was known as, as the Eden Mill, and uh, one paper mill, I'm not going to discuss this because Mountain Creek has a story all of its own, the Sandy Mater Road, there are about seven mills there, <coughs> including many paper mills, and the one happens to be there. Um, one, this is not mar as marked as a mill, but if you look at the side of the map, you can tell it's on a race, and that was, the, what I've named the Burkholder Mill, um, <clears throat> Craighead Mill, because we're in Craighead territory here. The Woolen Mill at, uh, it's a little bit downstream, and this mill is, there is identified as Light's Mill. Many of you might know it as Isha's Mill or Breckville's Mill. 
Then when we get closer to Boiling Springs, we have a clover mill, Jill and Peters, and of course, at Boiling Springs itself, the Aggies built the grist mill at this part of the ironworks. So we'll begin with the Eden Mill and take a look at this very long head race. And it was a cluster of mills in that area. There are two names, major names associated with it, the Moors, William Moore and the Rittners. Uh, the, the mill was actually built by the Moors. So then the race divides here and there's, you can see a cluster of buildings along the race and then it empties back into the yellow breaches. This is the earliest photo I could find of the mill complex. Often these mills have plural names, Eden Mills, because there, there were a variety of mills located there. So here we see uh, William Moore's stone house. It was built uh, uh, in the early, or the late 1700s. Uh, the mill was actually built by the Moors in 1765. So we had the Moore uh, farmhouse and their barn and their wagon shed. The road itself makes a big curve here and goes by the barn. And we can see the main mill itself. This was the uh, sawmill part of it, and this was the plaster mill. Uh, we were fortunate to locate a, a photo album that came from a descendant of the Rittner family that has photographs of this area around 1905. This is one of the about 58 photos that are in that album showing the mill itself and the bridge. The bridge is crossing there, the race, not the creek itself. And here are several of the uh, Rittner grandchildren. Uh, on that same bridge. In the background, you can see the road going to the car. This is Route 34 today. And uh, parallel to it, where you see some tracks, that was the Holly Trolley. And Holly Trolley came uh, down there, but didn't go across this bridge, of course. It had its own bridge that, and went behind the mill itself. And this is something you often see around mills or some. Some of the millstones, they may have been discarded, they may have been ones that were to replace ones in the future. Now this view uh, is identified as a trio of ducks. <laughs> Their names were Spot, Toppy, and Wash. <laughs> the, uh, the brick building, the brick house in the background, we refer to as the Rittner House. The Rittner family built that around 1850. And Jacob Rittner, who owned and operated the mill, was a son of Governor Joseph Rittner. And after uh, Joseph Rittner was retired and his wife died, he moved and lived in that home for quite a, a time during his retirement with his son. This is a good view of the, uh, not focus-wise, we can't help that. Um, it's a good view of the mill whenever it was still in operation. It was a large merchant mill that served the surrounding area. The Eden name goes way back in its history. You're not sure where that came from. You could just describe, you know, this was a beautiful, pleasant, ideal place for a business. And, and so that's why it was called Eden. Here we see a member, one of the members of the family on horseback with the mill in the background and the Jackson OK flower wagon in the background. Since this was a merchant mill, they probably had their flower made at this mill. Now this view is not from the album, it's taken around 1915. And at that time, the mill was owned by Charles, by the Coyle family, Charles T. Coyle, who's standing here. And you can see one of the trolleys going by in the background. Now this slide, this slide is an excerpt from a very valuable source that we located that we use a lot in our articles. It was called the Decennial Manufacturer's Census. It was a federal census conducted every 10 years for any business that made a profit of $500 or more a year. 
and each business had to provide information about their operations. This is uh, this particular one uh, is for Eaton Mill, and at the time the operator was William P. Moore. The type of mill was flour. He had twelve thousand dollars invested in the property. It was, his value was at twelve thousand. It was water powered, which we were always looking for that word because this is water powered industries. Um, the water power produced nine horsepower. They employed two people for 12 months, year-round operation, and they together they, they were paid $900 a year. Uh, it's sort of surprising when you see these huge complexes and then you see how many people worked at them. It's, it's usually only two people. They were so well-built and so it's a matter of moving levers uh, to get process rolling along. Uh, under, and if the other part of this chart shows what their raw materials they work with, like of course most of it being a, a grist mill, a main thing would be wheat, how many bushels did they process a year? Approximately 14,000. These are value, whoops, I don't know what happened there. So they use the wheat, excuse me here, wheat to produce flour, and they from this fourteen thousand they cross they produced three thousand bushels of wheat, and there's the value of that. They did also work with some other grains, which but they were used for chop, which was to produce animal feed, and they had processed a little bit of buckwheat, one of my favorite flours, uh, and then they then they produced the thirteen uh, barrels a year of buckwheat, so it wasn't that popular. This is Eden Mill, and it did stand for a long time. It, this is it in 1964. It was demol demolished shortly after this picture was taken. Uh, the road, this was, the road had made that bend, and then it went across, does anybody know what's happening here? Uh, this was nicknamed Dead Man's Curve because there were quite a few accidents here. There were families in the area, and so the mill, the road was straightened, and it, the mill had to go down. A new bridge was built, and that was the, the end of the mill. As you can see at this point, though, it was no longer no longer being used. Uh, Okay, this is, I don't know what we're doing here. It's the, uh, this is a, a close up of the 1858 map showing the Burkholder Mill. I said, the mill that really wasn't ever mentioned anywhere, but Jacob Burkholder, who lived here, had this, built this race on his property, and that little dot there would, would be the mill. This race still survives, as you can see in this slide. Uh, it's located on the Pepper Farm in, on Old York Road, along the Old York Road. If we go a little further down that race, we'll, we'll come to a, remains of an old dam. These stand behind the Coil Lumber Company near Craighead. And the dam uh, controlled the amount of water that was fed into the mill. They usually had some sort of a, 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 a way, an overflow device to control the amount of water that actually entered the mill. So this, the water, but when this was in operation, when, it was not, when the mill was in operation, the water would be forced in here, into this channel, and the mill would have stood on that channel. So the remains of that uh, stone line champ uh, mill race are still standing, head race. And on the bank beside, you can see ruins of the foundation of a large building, which would have been the mill. That uh, mill w went out of business, of course, and uh, it, 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 it was in business until about 1855. Then it, I don't know what happened in between. It wasn't used, but it was later used in the 1890s by the Craigheads as a planing mill. 
And the Jacob Burkholder House, which was, was near the mill, built in 1790, is still standing it's along Old York Road. That's an early picture of it. The next mill downstream was the Craighead Mill, and this is an uh, 1830 uh, road paper that was very informative. You can see uh, the Burkholder land, generally where the, the, the previous uh, mill was located. Here's the dam for Craighead Mill. The main body of goat continues in this direction, but the, here's the, the uh, race, the head race, and the mansion house. Now that's not the Craighead Mansion we talk about today. That's over here. I'll, we have a photograph, and that's, it's still standing. This is the house, Miller's house in the mill, and then after the went through the mill, the race went back to the Yellow Breaches. It's located along what they call Walnut Bottom Road and Forge Road, which is 174 today, and this road to Carlisle would be uh, Bonnie Brook Road. The, this, the Craighead Mill was built by Thomas Craighead. The, this was the one we looked at. Burkholder Mill here. Here the, is the race coming off for Craighead. The mill is located here and then flows back in to the Yellow Breaches. This is a current view of the Lowhead Dam behind the Craighead House that we are familiar with. On a, it's located on a bend in the creek. It was on this bend that the first Craighead who came to America built its log house. So this low head uh, dam directs the water, forces some water off here to the left into that race, which still uh, is in existence. Many of the races are still in place, the mills are gone. And this is an earlier photograph taken in 1918 showing two of the Craighead women on the railroad bridge at Craighead. Here's that. Lowhead Dam and the race will be going off to the left. It goes underneath, uh, you see a little bridge here that replaced, it's flowing uh, underneath and past the, what the Craigheads called their mansion house. And that's still standing on the auto farm which has recently been sold. Uh, and somebody, a man was just in who bought that, it's going to be stored. And this is the only known photo that we have of what the Craighead Mill actually looked like, taken around 1875. This photo was probably used at, for Wing's history four years later when the, they made a drawing for his an illustration for the Wing's history. The mill house still stands in the corner of Old York Road and LaRue Road, so it's still there. And the mill itself operated until 1944 when it burned on a very cold January night. The owner, it was owned by Thomas Klein and was operated by Wilbur Deal, the father of some of the Deal brothers that some of us are familiar with. The foundation walls are still visible in a garden behind, uh, along the mill race on the property. The next mill uh, is Horner's Mill, and it was built by Gilson Craighead around 1798. Uh, it had a relatively short, right here it is, it's a very short race. And we only have one known photograph taken in, around eight, in the 1880s. You can see that the, the fall of the water was re relatively short compared to the size of the men standing above it. This mill, uh, Gilson Craighead was an investor. He built these as investments and he rented them. The mill was, so this was operated by many different renters. Inside there would have been looms and a carding machine. Then uh, they made woolen and flannel goods, clothing, uh, cloth, blankets, carpet, things that we don't that usually associate that much with mills. The mill was last owned by the Horner family, and that's the name that it goes by. Here they're shown in their garden um, with their brick house behind them. And in, in the distance behind there, you can see how close the mill, this is the mill behind them. It's fairly close to the house. So I trace this down, and um, 
this picture is I'm standing where the mill was. I'm looking back at the brick house. And I, I took the picture along and I told the man, I said, uh, they must have, where's the brick house? Or this, and he said, well, this is brick underneath the side. So it is still standing. <laughs> And this photo was taken as uh, standing in the, the race. Of course, the race is now dry, and the mill stood approximately in this area. Now we move on to the next to the Breckville Mill. Um, we've seen, heard in the news lately about Kunkel's Bridge being closed on Petersburg Road. Well, that's where it is. And right before the bridge, there's a, the race begins, goes to almost directly to the mill and then has a long tail race back into the yellow breaches. The mill was owned by Isaiah Light, and that's not spelled right on there. Um, they made a mistake on the map. And this was, built, was another mill built by Gilson Craighead. He built this one around 1817. It was a large four-story merchant mill, it had four pair of driving stones and two water wheels. This view was taken about 1915 when it was owned and operated by John Foreman. The mill was last owned and operated by Daniel Gesch about eight, 1945, and then it fell into disrepair, as you can see. It eventually became a, a residence, and Albert A. Bell, a Cumberland County woodcarver, lived here in the late 50s, and he died here in 1964. While the family was living there, there was a tornado that took off part of the roof, so they moved into a trailer that was on the site. Uh, in the late 60s, after the Abels sold it, in the late 60s and 70s, there were absentee uh, land owners, and many a group of hippies moved into the mill. So we were always referred to this as the hippie mill. Quite a few stories about it their tenure of the mill. <laughs> then in the uh, 1980s, the mill was partially demolished, the roof was taken off, and the remainder was converted into a residence, and this is the current view of what the mill looks like. The race is still intact, and you can see it flows, still flows under the building and into this tail race. Now moving on to Boiling Springs, we see the, the uh, John Peters Clover Mill. This was gone by the 1860s, and there's no trace of it. Uh, but we do see the long hand dug race about a half mile for the mill in Boiling Springs. We also see where Daniel Kaufman lived, who was also very active in the Underground Railroad, and he operated a, his station in this general area and hid slaves over on this side. This is one of my, uh, being a, lo a lover of Boiling Springs, I, um, this is my favorite drawings that we discovered some years ago. An 1832 view of what the, the area looked like at that time before the village actually was laid out. But here you can see very clearly the dam, the half mile long hand dug race that was fed into the Michael Eggie's mill at the ironworks. Now the lake itself was created some years before to power the forge and the furnaces. So they needed a new source for the mill. And everybody thinks when they see the mill down there, what well, must have been powered off the lake, but it really wasn't. They had to do all this instead. This is a, an early view of the uh, dam at Allen Grove, but where the race began. The fence on the other side was uh, the entrance to, along the entrance to uh, Allen Grove Park, which was a railroad park built there. And of course here, we, this is about 1872 view of the Carlisle Iron Works. We do talk more in the book about you know, the furnace and the forge there that were water powered. But the mill was built at, because they needed feed and flour for the employees of the mill. This, this is an early view around 1875, what the mill looked like, and in the 1880s, with some activity in the area. Uh, these earlier, both of those uh, illustrations show that it's called Boiling Spring Mills, right the floor. Today we call, we call Boiling Springs Mill. 
not sure why. Probably because they, they did more than several, they had several mills there. Here's a view of the, the site in 1920 showing several discarded uh, millstones and the remains of the uh, tail rays coming at the back of the mill can be seen. Jared Booker, the Booker family, were the owners of the ironworks end of the mill for about 50 years, and he often rented the mill out to other people. In around 1900, it was rented and operated by the Paxton Flour and Feed Company. The Booker family converted the mill into apartments in 1930s, and today the mill is still a familiar landmark at the lower end of the Boiling Springs Lake, and it is still an apartment house. Now we're moving into Monroe Township, um, and I highlighted the mills that we've talked about. This is generally in the Allenberry area, there was a distillery there and uh, operated by the Bell Supers, but the Bell Supers also built a large mill here known as Bell Super Mill. They were also owned this one at the time of the map, but we usually refer to this as, as the, uh, the, the mill, Lydic, Lydic's mill. And then all these are Brant mills, the Brant family near Brantsville, and Gibbler Mill on the way to Williams Grove, which is Williams Grove, Williams Mill. First of all, the, the Beltsover Mill. The Beltsover Mill was built, this, this mill was built around 1840 on the site of an earlier mill, which was back into the 1700s. And this is taken around 1890, and you see them loading barrels of flour on the wagon. Their, their flour brand was called Universal Flour. Here's the mill in the early 1920s. By that time, it was known as Spangler's Mill. And here we see women help with the milling work too. Two women are helping to unload grain that's to be processed. And some of the children enjoy <laughs> swinging on the rope of the uh, mill's grain hoist. Spangler's Mill burned in 1927. A new mill was built to, to replace a, a frame mill, but it burned in, in 1932, five years later. As was mentioned, many of the county mills were lost by fire, and we, in our book, we have, have record of 36 major fires and mills. Now, Spangler's Mill was located on, on what's known as Long Road. I'd never been on it before. Uh, it's not very long. I think it's named after a person named Long. There's only two houses on it. But you do reach, uh, when you, when you Go to a short distance, you come to the uh, this dam, which is the dam for the uh, bank of the Spangler's Mill. The owner has beautified the area and he's maintained the race, he even has a new um, floodgate control there to control the amount of water going into the race. Where the mill stood, there's a small white building, probably built in the 30s or 40s. And the owner, at, at probably that time, had to put a turbine in there, and he generated electricity for his own property. So the Bill Tuber's Mill, one we saw, the beautiful big tall one, sort of stood in this general area at one time. The next mill is uh, Lydix Mill, located in an area we refer to as Lydix Station. It, it has a large... Uh, it, the Harrisburg Potomac Railroad went through here and they had a station and they built that bridge. And this was the dam, which is, I don't think it's there anymore. Um, the forced water in this direction into the, a mill race to feed uh, the, the dam. Then the end of the mill. I was not, when I was not able to find any photographs of the mill there. This is a fairly recent aerial Google app, you, you see that the Yellow Breach itself makes a huge loop here. And then at, here's the, the railroad and the railroad bridge and the dam, and then there are uh, two different races coming off here. The mill was about where this building is. There it came back again. Um, 
that sliding smell. Moving to Brantsville, Brantsville is a researcher's nightmare, I can tell you that. I mean, Master Pro up area there has seven mills. They're all named Brant Mills, and they all, they all had the same names. They kept repeating every generation. So it was very difficult to, uh, to, to research them. Um, there was a, a large sawmill that was water powered about a mile upstream. Here we see braces on both sides of Brantsville, and there was also another mill at the, at the uh, about a half mile downstream operated by the Brants. They had grist mills, saw mills, clover mills, paint mills, and distilleries in that site. They owned the land, uh, they got the land in 1771. So there's not, of course, there's not enough time to discuss this cluster of mills in any detail. What was helpful to me was this 1832 road paper that said down in the corner that the land on the north side belonged to John and Joseph Brandt and on the south side to Martin Brandt. Now they weren't a real, really great artist like some of these, but it, uh, we have the main branch, we have the mill dam, up here is a race going off on the south side leading to a clover mill here and a saw mill here. And then another race on the north side was a saw mill and a plaster mill and a merchant mill and then going back in the old reaches. This one still survives. As you go drive through the Brantsville area, you go along that race across the bridge. This mill, uh, known as Gilbert's Mill, was actually built by an Englishman uh, named jo John Clark. It was the Clark's Mill in the early days, built around 1774. <laughs> It was sold in uh, 1848 to Benjamin Gibbler. That's the name we usually associate it with. It's located on Park Place, on the road to Williams Grove. And these next several views were taken in uh, 1965. That's The race is still there, but very little <coughs> water in it, uh, as it originally had. Uh, this shows that uh, this includes a little house. So if you remember driving in this road, there was this house that you wondered why it would ever survive because it seemed to be practically in the middle of the road. It was eventually taken down in 2001. It was, it, but it was the original log of uh, Miller's house. And this, uh, another view of it in the same time period before it was converted into a residence. <coughs> This mill, like several others that I, I didn't have time to talk about, uh, were used to produce electricity in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, one of the last owners being Metropolitan Edison, the name we all recognize. The mill was uh, stabilized and converted into a unique residence in the 1990s. Uh, the owner would like to use this as a bed and breakfast, but zoning in Monroe Township does not permit small businesses. <coughs> And this is a, one, a, a good example of a, one of the millstones that was recovered, and he used it there as a splash guard for his baton. This is an 1892 view of the, of the creek and uh, Williams Grove, and there was a large stone grist mill in Williams Grove built by the Gregory family about 1800 sold to the Williams family in 1856 and was known as the Williams Mill then until uh, it operated until about 1883. It went through a series of transformations. Uh, eventually the foundation, on the foundation there was put, built a, a wooden structure and by the 1950s it looks like that was converted into a residence. It was still standing in 1975 when Jim Branty took this photo but all that remains there today is the trace, the race is there and you can see a trace of some of the stone foundations of the original mill. So that's a fairly quick overview of those two townships and now Mary Lou is going to uh, take us into the Allens. <coughs> Richard didn't jinx this for me. Uh, hello. What are the two biggest threats to a mill? Floods and fire. 
Several of the mills along the lower yellow breaches were destroyed by fire, and I'm going to talk about some of those this afternoon, as well as some of the causes of mill fires. <laughs> there we go. This is an illustration of the explosion of the Washburn Mill in Minneapolis in 1878. A dust explosion was a constant threat in a flour mill. The 1878 Washburn Mill explosion in Minneapolis is one of the most infamous flour mill explosions in history. It killed 17 people, pulverized the main building as you can see, and devastated seven more. The explosion was so powerful that it broke windows as far away as St. Paul. There was no dust catching filter in use in the mill because although there had been several uh, explosions in Europe, no one believed that dust could actually catch fire and explode. The disaster prompted mills throughout the country to install better ventilation systems to prevent dust buildup. The dust explosion at Litchfield, Illinois flour mill in 1893 destroyed 40 homes and two entire blocks of local businesses. The damage to the mill alone was $1 million. The explosion, though, directly resulted in more stringent regulations for fire suppression systems in mills, as well as regular inspection and requiring training for all employees who would be using the dust machine. There are other ways that mills can accidentally catch fire, but sometimes they're destroyed intentionally by arson. Thomas Stevens Glenwood Mills in Upper Allen Township, there we go, um, was destroyed by an arsonist. This 1858 map shows a portion of, oh, technology. Well, this map shows a portion of Upper Allen Township, and you can see the location of Stevens Woolen Mill right at the bottom as well as other mills along the Yellow Breaches. This is the 1872 atlas showing uh, Glenwood Mills Thomas Stevens Woolen Factory. Having run Glenwood Mills for 20 years, Stevens retired and sold the business to Jacob Hartman in 1878. Hartman only owned the mill for one year when an arsonist burned it down in 1879. The fire was discovered at 4 o'clock in the morning on the day after Christmas. The newspaper reported that a ladder that had been lying uh, quite a ways from the mill was found propped up against the mill and a window had been broken. The newspaper reported that the mill had been built of logs in 1818 and had run continuously as a woolen factory since then. But a year ago, when Mr. Hartman bought it, he put machinery in for grinding grain. The fire destroyed the mill, the machinery, and all of its contents. The <coughs> loss amounted to about $2,000, but Mr. Hartman was only insured for $500. The paper stated that it was no doubt the work of an incendiary. This is a photograph of Lisburn Mill. How many of you in this room have been to Lisburn? That's a gem. Good. Uh, this county is so large that uh, going from, say, Cleversburg to Lisburn, you, you realize how large the county is. Um, the horses are hitched up to the mill wagon, brightly painted mill wagon. It advertised the mill as it went around the county. The village of Lisburn in Lower Allen Township was laid out about 1860, uh, not, I'm sorry, 1760, but a mill had been operating on that spot since 1751. A vital operation and a landmark in that part of the county. The mill was operated continuously by generations of millers. The mill was owned and operated by the Hoffman family when it caught fire on March 28, 1940. 
The day after the fire, the Harrisburg Patriot ran a story about the fire under the headlines, Mill at Lisburn Raised by Flames. Loss is $65,000. Firemen from three towns battle the blaze for five hours. Owner has no insurance on structure or contents. His wife suffers a heart attack in the excitement. Three autos, new power plant, 3,500 bushels of wheat and tons of feed are lost. The newspaper article explained that at about 3 o'clock, a neighbor <coughs> saw smoke pouring from the corner of the building. He alerted employee Wilbur Snellbaker, and together they drove one of the mill's delivery trucks to safety. Hoffman was at home nearby. When he heard shouting and saw the flames, he called several fire departments. The article noted that despite the age of the mill, the plant contained modern milling equipment, including a hammer mill, purifying devices, bins, a bag stitching machine, and many small pieces. The origin of the fire remained undetermined, and the newspaper recorded that the mill replaced an earlier mill, which had been leveled by flames 70 years before. This is a portion of the 1872 Atlas of Cumberland County showing Lower Allen Township. As you're aware, as you've heard from Richard and David, the names of mills changed many times during their lifespan. The location of the next mill that I want to talk about, Edders Mill, is shown on this map as S. Bittner's Grist Mill. Edder's Mill was destroyed by fire on April 5th, 1918. The Mechanicsburg Saturday Journal ran the following article the next day. Historic Mill Destroyed, Friday morning. The stone flour mill along the Yellow Breaches near White Hill was totally destroyed by fire of an unknown origin which is supposed to have started in the cellar of the mill. The mill was one of the interesting sites on the lower end of Cumberland County and is said to be over 100 years old. It was known as Calvin Edder's Mill, but it was owned by the estate of Marlon E. Olmsted. The building was a three-story stone structure and at the time of the fire was operated by C.S. Willis. One hour after the fire started, the building was a mass of ruins. With the building was destroyed much valuable machinery, more than 3,000 bushels of wheat and bushels of corn and rye and rice, and all of these were being used uh, to make wheat for war flour. The flames were discovered at 5 o'clock by Elmer Klein, a mill hand. He rushed to his home beside the mill to warn his family and when he got back to the structure, it was a mass of flames. He broke a window. The only thing he was able to rescue were a number of books from the office. The New Cumberland Fire Company was summoned, and in their big chemical truck, the two-mile trip was made in just a few minutes, but the fire had gained so much headway that they couldn't do anything about it. Men from Everly Mills ran the half a mile to the scene and tried to give aid but their efforts were unavailing. The loss of the building was estimated at over $7,000 and the contents $15,000. Mr. Willis said that he had just about closed a deal for the sale of a carload of flour. And of course, he had little insurance. As there had been no fire about the building, many are inclined to believe it was incendiary in origin while others believe that maybe it was caused by friction of the pulleys. The mill had been in operation day and night to meet its demands. When you read the soon to be published mill book, you'll learn about other fires, as Richard said, at least 36 fires are documented. Fortunately, the mill that I want to end with today, Glen Allen, suffered no fires in its history. Isn't that charming? <laughs> this delightful illustration of Glen Allen Mill 
um, was done when it was owned by Levi Lance, and it was produced for Wing's 1879 History of Cumberland County. And here are a few other images of the mill. Glen Allen Mill, situated on the Yellow Breaches Creek and McCormick Road in Upper Allen Township, is one of the best preserved mills in Cumberland County. The three and a half story brick mill that we see in these images was rebuilt by George Lance in 1820 on stone foundations from the 18th century mill. The mill, as reconstructed by Lance, included four pairs of grinding stones. These stones appear to be burr stones from France. Three pairs were four feet in diameter, and one pair was four foot six inches. The mill included a system for lifting bags of grain to the top floor. From there, the grain was conveyed by chutes to the grinding stones. The mill was lifted by conveyors to the cleaning and sifting equipment on the upper floors. This photo taken in 2011 by Bob Rowland shows the millstones, grain hopper, shoe, and millstone hoist on the first floor of Glen Allen. This photo taken in May of 2014 by Jim Bradley shows the millstones on the first floor of Glen Allen. The Lance family owned the mill for almost 100 years. When George Lance died in 1856, his wife inherited it, and she bequeathed it to her son, Levi Lance. And he registered the mill's brand mark in the summer of 1865 as Glen Allen Mills Superfine Extra Family Number 196. <laughs> that sounded like Greek to me until I looked up the definition. Superfine means it's white flour, and 196 uh, is the number of the that was required by law to have 196 pounds in a barrel of flour. The mill went out of ownership of the Lance family in 1902, and it was sold to Henry B. McCormick. Glen Allen ceased operations shortly after the death of Mary Boyd McCormick in 1940. A cornmeal business was put into operation in 1941. And the business continued until 1960, when Raymond Miller, the last Miller at Glen Allen, retired. He had been a lifetime employee of the McCormick's. Uh, he started out as a water boy when the McCormick Mansion was built across the Yellow Breaches Creek, and had been involved in all aspects of its maintenance. Floods during the 1960s destroyed the dam eliminating any hope of restarting the mill operation. The mill building and its two-acre tract were sold in 1965 and purchased by John Nidell. He lived off-site and was instrumental in opening the mill for tours and special events. A small stage for holding various uh, musical events was added to the large first-floor room, and the practice has been continued by the succeeding owners, David and Kathy McCorkle, with their music at the mill concerts. Except for a little deterioration, the mill has remained unchanged in recent years. The last of the four horizontal water wheels was destroyed by floodwaters in <coughs> Tropical Storm Eloise in 1975, which damaged the channel walls. The upstream and the downstream raceways have both disappeared. The wooden components, such as the horizontal conveyors, the chutes for gravity feeding the equipment, the cranes for lifting the grinding stones, all remain in reasonably good condition. For those of you who would like to see Glen Allen Mill, the Historical Society, as you were told, is offering guided tours in May of Cumberland County Mills along the Conn of Winnet Creek and along the Yellow Breaches Creek. And now, Richard, David, and I will take a few questions. And I'd like to thank you for coming.